Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Aziz Shaykhani from Lahi Radia. Our guest, Rana Husseini, uh, she is a journalist from Jordan. Welcome to this event that organized by Lahi Radio and also Nomerta Publishing Limited. Our theme is an honor killing. Our guest, Rana Hussein, is a Jordanian journalist woman. Rana wrote the book, Murder in the Name of Honor, that translated into Finnish by Anuka Kolehmanen and published this month by Nomerta Publishing Limited. Her book looks into the violence against women under the name of Hona. This book is based on interviews of victims, families and others, including killers. Rana has done a lot of work on crimes and violence against women, especially the Hona killing. She has earned nine international and local awards for reporting on crimes of Hona. She won the 1995 Mid News Prize Award for Best Article Murder in the Name of Hone. A group of young Jordanians with Husseini tried to organize grassroots movements to fight this phenomenon in 1998. The result was the formation of the National Jordanian Committee to eliminate so called crimes of Hone. The committee managed to raise people's awareness about these crimes against women in society. In addition, the committee collected over 15,000 signatures demanding the cancellation of all the laws that offer leniency for such murders. Rana Husseini has fought more than 20 years against an unbelievable crime. Rana Husseini also work as a regional coordinator for the United Nations Development Fund for Women, campaigning to eliminate violence against women in five Arab countries. Rana Husseini managed a three-year program to monitor and analyze the content of the printed media in Jordan in terms of what is being reported on women, including images, reports, caricatures, columns, editorials, and features. First of all, welcome to Finland and to this event. Tell us a bit about your childhood. What kind of childhood do you have had? Okay. Thank you for hosting me and thank you for coming. Um, my childhood was a good childhood. I come from an open-minded family. Um, I was uh, living, I would say, to middle class. Um, I was in a co-ed school, private school, so it was, a, it was a nice childhood. I didn't have any problems when I was a child, and uh, I loved sports. I was a basketball and handball player, so throughout my childhood and teenhood uh, life, I was uh, playing all kinds of sports with the national team, with the club team, with the school team. What do you remember or know about the role of women in family and society when you were a child? How that time the men did treat their women, girls and sisters? Well, uh, I, don't, I don't remember a lot because I was a lot involved in sports. Uh, so I can tell you that nowadays people are more conservative and extreme than it was during uh, my childhood. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the world develops, but uh, somehow we're going backwards. But we, I did know when I was young, I did know that there is discrimination. And there, I felt the discrimination in sports because they were always uh, favoring uh, men's teams. Uh, for example, in basketball, they always group them. They uh, let them play. They bring them clothes and everything. And we always grouped ourselves, and uh, we brought our own clothes and paid for our own clothes, and we felt we felt that discrimination. You have studied in the United States of America for many years. How was these years? And being far from your culture, your country, your family, opened a new way to focus on the women's issue in society, especially in Jordan. Of course, uh, the, the studying abroad gave me a very, very important uh, experience. Uh, I studied in the U.S. for six years, and I did a lot of things that I couldn't do in Jordan. 
like work. Um, I had like two or three jobs at one point and uh, I used that to pay for my school. And this is something that was not uh, uh, typical at that time. Um, I also worked for the school's newspaper and I felt over there that there was a bit discrimination also there uh, regarding the coverage of women's sports. So I focused on that. And uh, my work of course uh, shaped my personality and uh, I felt that I was able uh, to, be, uh, to empower myself with my work because I was making money, I was talking to people, I was being exposed to things. And then the last semester uh, of my school I did an internship with, with a local newspaper. And uh, I was focusing on social issues, and I liked how people were helping each other. Uh, you know, like uh, prisoners when they finish, uh, you know, their term, somebody's trying to help them with a small job so they know they have they don't go and uh, get wasted or something. So I was really impressed with how the society tends to help each other. And I said, you know, I wanted to focus on social issues in Jordan because. Uh, I knew that at least socially you can make a difference and uh, I knew in my mind that I wanted to work on women's issues but this issue was not on my mind at all at that time. Was really Kifaya and her story behind of your activity on violence against women from 1993? Uh, for sure, it was uh, her story, uh, the, her sad story that uh, made me do everything I'm doing. Uh, when I was, uh, when I returned to Jordan, I was appointed as the crime reporter, and I really didn't uh, didn't have any idea that what I wanted to do. I just said, okay, they gave me this, I'll just work with it and work my way up, and then and do something else. But then I came across this sad story of this Kifaya, 16-year-old schoolgirl who was killed by her family because uh, one of her brothers raped her. Uh, they basically blamed her for the rape. It's, this is not like a daily occurrence in Jordan, but this was the story uh, you know, that I came across. Um, this woman you know, was a victim five or six times because uh, her brother raped her, then he threatened to kill her. She became pregnant, she had to tell her family. She, he tried to kill her, she survived. She had an abortion and then they married her off to a man 34 years older than her. Six months later, this man divorced her, and the day he divorced her, a second brother uh, murdered her because of the rape. And when I went to, question, to talk to the family, they, uh, their, her uncles, uh, they basically blamed her for the rape, and she, they said her uh, brother, she seduced her brother to speak with her. So for me, that was a shock. And at that time, really nobody was talking about this issue. So I decided that I want to document each and every case I heard about. You wrote the book, Mother in the Name of Honor. Why you did write this book? For what reason? <laughs> well, uh, in 1998, I won the Reebok Human Rights Award, which is an award given to uh, individuals in the world working on their work uh, on human rights. Uh, it uh, had a lot of money uh, prize. So, and the idea was for me to open an NGO, but I didn't want to open an NGO because I was effective with what I was doing. So somebody once suggested that I write a book. So, so this is how it started. Uh, it took around 10 years uh, because of sometimes there were political situations that was not encouraging to publish such a book because it could be misused. Um, so eventually I wrote the book and uh, there are several uh, reasons why I wrote the book. I wrote it for several reasons. One thing is uh, I wanted to document cases. Um, uh, you know, I wanted to give the women who died a name and face because someone deprived them of their right to live, so I wanted to give them the right to be known that this woman lived on this earth and someone took her life. Uh, I also wanted to be a credible source for anyone who wants to know about this topic. It's not, uh, we are not saying we don't have murders, and I'm not exaggerating, it's just factual. Uh, there is a lot of references and resources, and, uh, because, you know, this issue was abused by some for political and financial uh, gains. I also uh, documented cases in Jordan and work in Jordan and other countries. So it would be a tool or for anyone who wants to do campaigns or work on human rights to see what worked and what didn't work. And uh, you know, at one point I was receiving emails with dozens of questions from students, researchers. So I said, I'll just have a book out there to answer the questions. And in the book, of course, I give, I give uh, solutions in the end to, to this issue.
what kind of or what sort of feedback you have gotten from urban people in Jordan and other Arabic countries? In the beginning, people were very skeptical about my work. Or they were telling me, you know, what are you doing? You waste your time. Nothing ever changes in this country. You know. And some people were not encouraging, but then there were others who were encouraging. So all in all, uh, I felt that most people were for my work. Um, I haven't been directly threatened because of this work. I had some emails from people who are upset, or email who, uh, people who would just voice their rejection, but nothing really major or aggressive. Uh, your book is translated into a Finnish language. What do you feel about it? I think it's a nice thing to have your book published uh, to other languages. It's now, I wrote it in English and uh, uh, it was translated to Arabic and to Dutch and now Finnish and I hope it will be translated to other languages because I think you need to raise awareness about uh, this issue and about violence against women because uh, violence against women is an international uh, problem and I don't think it's restricted to any country or religion or class. So we have to constantly talk about this and the more you have material about this issue and other issues, the better it is for women to empower them and to raise awareness about this issue. Now is the right time to ask you, what is an honor killing? <laughs> How it differs from stoning up women as a punishment for adultery? And a so-called honor crime occurs when a family of female relative decides to kill their female relative because in their point of view she tarnished their image or reputation. And this could be by uh, becoming pregnant out of wedlock, going out with a strange man, being a victim of rape, incest, rumors, suspicions, uh, for leaving her house, for losing her virginity, um, for wanting to marry a man against her family's wishes or from a different religion. So basically these are uh, the majority of the reasons, based on my opinion, that uh, leads to these murders. How and why women represent the honor of clan, family, society, and country? Uh, if you look back in history, the history lesson. Yeah, the history lesson. <laughs> if you, back, you look back in history, during the ancient civilizations, uh, women were also always perceived uh, as the protectors of honor in some civilizations, like the Roman, uh, Roman uh, uh, civilization, the Manolo. They had special punishment for women, adulterers. Meanwhile, men could do whatever they want. Women were considered the property of their family, their father, and then once she married, she's the property of her husband. Uh, throughout history, if you to go through history, you will see that women were in the dark ages, they used to be uh, dealt with as witches in, by church. Any wise woman, they would say she's crazy, or uh, you know, they would burn her, or if she committed adultery, they would uh, kill her. So this is not something that we just woke up grew up to this life to say, oh, women are uh, being looked like that. I think it's an ancient practice that went through generations and generations and generations. In some countries it changed, in some countries it didn't, it didn't change. And I think we are in the process of changing this. What makes killer? Society, religion, culture, revenge? Um, I think that uh, religion has nothing to do with it. I've never interviewed anyone who told me that he killed his sister because the religion told him that. I think it's wrongful cultural traditions and beliefs uh, that, are, uh, that some families believe in and they apply it on their daughters mainly. Of course, there are men who get killed. For example, in Pakistan you have also men, but of course the number of women is much higher. So I think it's more uh, about culture, about the fear of other, what the other would think about me if my daughter did this or did that. So uh, the easiest way is to get rid of this source of so-called shame. And that's, that's, I think, the reason. Uh, but you have mentioned sometimes, uh, no, also, it is cultural and traditional. But as you know, there is a big tie between the culture and religion. What do you say about it? I'm not a social expert, so I cannot answer you clearly about this, but what I can say is that I think anyone who is religious enough would know that they, can, they shouldn't kill. Because none, none of the religions, the major religions, says you have to kill for this. You can't find it anywhere. So I, you know, if anyone really understands the religion, well, they shouldn't kill. Why honor killing happened more in collective society? 
what is the difference between individual and collective society and their identity. For instance, when we are talking about the Jordanian and Finnish society, there is two different, two kind, uh, different societies. One of them is collective society and Finnish society more than individual society. As I, as I mentioned a little bit uh, earlier, uh, there is this uh, culture of fear and what others might think of. So, uh, I, in my experience, my field, uh, my field uh, investigation of these murders, uh, these murders happen in middle to lower class, where, the, uh, where there's a condensed uh, population, the word of mouth travels quickly, uh, the rumors start, people start to talk, so people find no solution but to get rid of this uh, usually talking which is supposedly caused by women. Why in some cases mother, sister or other relatives help the men to kill family? Well, there are two kinds of, uh, of females, if you want to say it, in the families. There are ones who are brought up to believe that women are the cause of everything and they, they, they deserve to be punished if they did commit something wrong, in their point of view, and, uh, uh, and they think that if a woman did something wrong, she deserves to be killed so that she would be a lesson to others, not to do what she did. And there are others who believe that, of course, no, she shouldn't be killed, but they cannot stand up and, for that because they might be killed or harmed or if she's married she will be divorced or you know. So that's, that's the women's position in the family. According to your experience over years, what is the impact of law on reducing the honor killing in local, national and also international? Um, of course the law, uh, we've had a problem with the law as activists for the longest time. Um, when I first started to report about these murders, another shocking uh, issue for me was that uh, men would get three months, six months to one year for killing a female relative. So a lot of people were, uh, you know, saying, okay, I kill and then I get away with it. So this was a big issue and then we fought it and the law was changed. Now uh, it's a minimum of 10 years to life. Uh, of course, the law is very important because it, it preserves the, ri uh, the rights of the dead or the murdered. But I think it's, the law alone will not uh, solve the problem. It has to be solved from a comprehensive uh, uh, process, but the law is one factor. What do you think about the nature of political system and state? Because state is very important and it's law. Uh, it plays the leading role in the honor killing. Do you agree with this statement or not in the Middle East? Um, you know, uh, the, the, the majority of the countries in our part of the world, uh, they had uh, lenient laws when it comes to this issue. But some of them now are changing. Uh, but Lebanon and Palestine, they introduced uh, new laws. In Tunisia, of course, their laws are always good with women and now it's even better. Uh, but I think that most of the societies are now moving towards demanding better laws for women in general, uh, less discriminatory laws, because now the, the movements in our part of the world are becoming stronger in this regard. We have in every state a lot of beautiful laws. Why they cannot be implemented? For what reason? Uh, there are laws that have been applied, but there are some that uh, are, are still in the process or the application is not Correct. And I think this is a problem everywhere in the world. When you come to talk to activists about these things, they tell you the laws are there, but the problem is with the application. And this is the role of the civil society to follow up on that and be the watchdog. What is the role of Arabic language media on this field and also social media at the moment? Uh, as I said in the beginning, in the past, this issue was never tackled in the media and of course back then we didn't have social media. Uh, so it was rarely uh, tackled. Uh, but after our activism and activism in some other countries, uh, a lot has changed and now people talk about it, it's debated. Uh, in Egypt, for example, at one point they had the, the famous uh, movie stars, they had movies or series that tackled this, uh, issues related to women, violence, honor, rape, these things you would never dream of having maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the same with uh, all of, you know, in Jordan, because of the extensive wor uh, work that was done, a lot of people think that this is only happening in Jordan. 
but it's not. It's because we did a lot of uh, work on this issue. And now with the social media, of course, it's becoming even uh, easier and easier, and now people can comment. And from the comments, you see that there are more people now rejecting these murders and rejecting violence against women in general. Working on this issue in the CEPRO is not easy. What kind of challenges and difficulties you have faced during or more than two decades? You know, the, the most uh, problematic thing for me was to find information and find people who want to talk. Because most people who commit these murders, they want to end the rumors, the talking, the... So the last thing they want is for a journalist to come and tell the story. So basically this, this is, I think, is one of the most uh, uh, difficulties I faced. Another difficulty is that sometimes sources are, are not cooperative and sometimes I felt when uh, the, the media was uh, focusing on me or if I won an award or something, uh, they become not cooperative. I don't know, it's, it's uh, I don't know, human nature, but uh, unfortunately, this is what I faced. In your book, you mention or describe some of killers as the victims of cultural and traditional. Who is responsible for these crimes, if also they are victims? You said it, the, 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 the person, the, 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 the issue that's in charge is the culture itself. Uh, I don't think really, uh, in general, men who are brought up to love and protect their female relatives would want to kill them. But because of the social pressure, the family pressure, the neighbors, the, you know, they, they turn, unfortunately, they turn a normal human being into a killer. And that's another problem on its own. Why the statesmen and officials in the Middle East mentioned that Western countries gave the name of supporting the force against this honor killing try to influence the political situation and cultural background of people in this area? This is an excuse that is always used. <laughs> if they don't want to change the status quo and they, they're happy with that, they don't want to change it. And sometimes they use it to cover up some other things, like they want to uh, pass something and then they come and tell you, oh, you know, the West wants to do this and they start this big debate about, you know, the honor of the nation and the honor of the family and all of that and in the back door, you know, they're passing other uh, controversial laws without anybody noticing. Do you think somewhere in the world these stories may be used against Muslims? You know, unfortunately, yes, although uh, these, mur there, these murders happen in other religions. I have covered in Jordan several cases of uh, uh, women, Christian women who were killed for, by their families for reasons related to family honor. In Iraq, uh, you know, there's a Yazidi faith. Uh, there is in, uh, in India and Pakistan, they have different religions, including Sikh. It happens among the Sikh. So these, these murders happen among uh, all religions. But uh, I think after September 11th and even before, there has been this build up by the West of wanting to show Arabs and Muslims as evil creatures. Uh, so whenever a murder or anything happens bad that is done by a Muslim, this, it is immediately identified by the religion. If, for example, a Christian or whatever, European man, let's say, commits a murder, they never mention the religion, uh, if he's an a or she is an atheist, uh, Christian or Jews or whatever, you know, the only time it's mentioned, it's when it's an Arab or a Muslim, it's highlighted. And uh, the big example was two, two days ago with this uh, incident of a woman who was killed in Pakistan by her father. First of all, they used the headline stoning, and the woman was not stoned, she was blood gone to death. And then in the article, they had to put somewhere that they are Muslims. Violence is violence, and it is social problem where women and men can be victims. What do you say about this issue? Have you reported on violence against men? As we know, the men also suffered from different kinds of violence and some of them were killed but is hidden. The rates of violence against men has almost doubled since 2005 in the United Kingdom. Uh, this, is, this is the first time somebody has asked me this question in this form, <laughs> with statistics. Uh, of course, if there is uh, violence, uh, at least for me, when I work, if there is violence against men, I would report it. Uh, regardless, if a woman killed her husband, I would report it. We had a case in Jordan uh, whereby a woman killed her abusive husband. 
and she cut him into pieces with the help of her neighbor, and she boiled his head. Oh. <laughs> and uh, you know, but she was very, he was very abusive, and uh, he threatened. He was always threatening to take a second wife, uh, you know, on her. And there were cases where men were uh, were uh, killed, and I would report them uh, instead of women or with women, but very few, very few. Unfortunately, unfortunately, at least in Jordan, the majority of the violence, I would say 95%, is committed against women. What do you like about your work? I think it is your life. Um, there are many things. Uh, first of all, I like my work because it's, there's always something new every day. It's not a typical uh, job. I don't like typical life. The second uh, thing, and the most important thing, is that uh, you, you know you made a difference in people's lives. I know that I have saved lives, directly and indirectly. And I think this is the most noble thing, to be able to know that you helped someone uh, or saved a life. I think this is very important. I have a personal question. Are you married or not? Why? <laughs> I was engaged twice. But it didn't work out. Fish is going to save. Rana thank you very much for taking the time to answer my questions during this interview. At the last part of this interview, I want to ask what the next words do you mean? Please answer shortly and briefly. What's the Zaini. Zaini. What does it mean to you? Hana. Ah, oh, okay. Zain and Hana are my children of my brother. And uh, they mean a lot to me. And uh, as I said in the book, I hope when they grow up, this issue will be uh, something in the past for them. Tarja Halonen. Uh, of course, uh, you're always happy and proud uh, when you hear that a woman was a, a president of a country. And uh, it's, it's really, it's amazing. It makes you look up to them. And uh, because she spent a long time, I think 12 years she was a president. 12 years, yeah. So, you know, because she spent 12 years, this means she was uh, effective, uh, otherwise she wouldn't stay a president. So, uh, you know, it's very important to have uh, good examples like her, uh, you know, uh, uh, to have str women, strong women in strong positions, and to have women in positions not because they are women, but really because they are doing something uh, for their people and for their society. This is very important. This is how you improve uh, people's lives. Water. It's life. Kamel. Uh, stubborn. <laughs> Kamel is stubborn and it's not fun to ride it. King or queen? Uh, they, 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 it depends on their role in the society. They, they could be a nice uh, source of authority or uh, a catastrophic source of authority, catastrophic source of authority. Yesterday. It's just another day we learn from. Three Shaja. It's another sign of life. Uh, green. It gives you hope, it gives you uh, uh, hope. Uh, when you look at it, it's uh, full of life and uh, something to look for in the future. War. War? I said it all. Uh, war is destruction. I hope, I hope nobody ever sees war. Night. Night? I don't know, do you have it in Finland? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Money. Power. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. Uh, freedom of speech is uh, empowerment uh, to, to nations, to individuals and nations. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the son of Mary. I love Mary. So Jesus is the symbol of uh, forgiveness and love. Four eyewitnesses. Four eyewitnesses. <laughs> they can. There can never be f correct four eyewitnesses. Somebody will. Everyone will see the thing in a different eye, in a different view. Divorce. Divorce? Uh, divorce, it's, it's a freedom for both, but uh, I think uh, sorrow for the... If there are kids, it's a sorrow for the kids. Marriage. Marriage? I didn't experience it, but... Uh, <laughs> marriage uh, should be based on, uh, on understanding and uh, love and... Uh, giving up things, otherwise it will never succeed. Life, hayat. Life is the, is the most important thing that we have to fight for and uh, cherish. And that's one thing I'm fighting for. Death. Death is unavoidable. Rana Hussein.
<laughs> this is a hard one. <laughs> this is a hard one. It's just the last one. Nar Hussein. Rana Hussein. Uh, Saddam Hussein's daughter? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I figured it was. No comment. Thank you very much again. Thank you for everybody. Thank you for your interpretation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.